I want you to turn with me over to Romans chapter 5. We got one verse from chapter 5 to cover. Then we're moving into chapter 6 today. We're turning a corner in our study in Romans. Now, we have uh, been seeing for the first five chapters of Romans what God has done for us in providing eternal life, in providing salvation as a free gift through faith in Jesus Christ. The subject has been justification. Let me say very clearly today, let me say very clearly today, uh, all the religions of the world teach some sort of works for salvation. You have to be good. You have to follow the sacraments or the laws or the ordinances or the principles and all that to get to heaven, okay, to get to that place. But that is not the message of Christianity. The message of Christianity is not what we need to do. The message of Christianity is what Jesus Christ has done. It is what Jesus does or has done for us on the cross that gets us to heaven, not what we do as far as good deeds or good works. And that is the major difference, the major difference between all the world religions and true Christianity, true Christianity. And so uh, the subject has been to this point justification. Now, what does that mean? Please, if I use big words today, I'm going to define every single word uh, there's nothing wrong with the big words, okay? We kind of pride ourselves when we're using big words of the world because it makes us look educated. But sometimes we get to the, to the big, big words in the Bible and we say, oh, that's too complicated for me, and we zone out, okay? Boy, is that the devil's trick or what? Okay, listen, there's richness in the words of the Bible. And um, the word justification it has the idea of God declaring us as righteous. It's God's declaration that we are righteous. Now, it's not based on what we do. Again, it's based on what Jesus did for us. And it's very clear in Romans 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, being justified, how? Not by works, not by good deeds. No, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ that when he died on the cross, he completely paid the sin debt that we owe because we're sinners, okay? See, we deserve hell, my friend. We deserve to be lost forever, separated from God and suffering because God does not take sin lightly, all right? If this hand represents you and me and this wallet represents our sin, we're all sinners. Excuse me, we're all sinners. The Bible says, though God loves us, he hates our sin. Our sin separates us from God. Now, for you to get into heaven, for me to get into heaven, we cannot go with even one sin. So if you've sinned, you're disqualified. Do we get it? God says he can't let you in because heaven's a perfect place. Not even one lie can enter into heaven. See, here's the situation. This is how you have to be. You have to be sinless in the eyes of God. You have to have the very righteousness of God himself if you're going to get to heaven. None of us can do that. And God says, because we've sinned, our sin has a penalty, the wages of sin being death. We'd be separated from God for all eternity if we are going to pay for our own sin. You know, people who believe they can earn their way to heaven, they don't understand what they're saying. Okay? You're saying that you, that you are taking it upon yourself to pay for your sin. God says, okay, if that's what you're going to do, you'll be lost forever suffering for it. Lost forever. God doesn't want that for any of us. See, our good works will not take care of the sin. You could put a whole lifetime of good works on your sin and it won't take it away. It just covers it. No, we need it taken away. Well, how does that happen? There's only one way. God sent his son, the father sent the son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the savior of the world. And when Jesus came, God in the flesh, he came, lived a perfect life, went to the cross, and when he died on the cross, he died in our place, on our behalf, as our substitute. He took our sin upon himself, and he made the payment, so we don't have to. He paid it all, past, present, and future. And he died, and he rose from the grave three days later. And he says in his word this, that if you will trust in him, that he made that payment for you, the moment you do, the payment he made is good on your behalf. And then God looks at you and me, and he declares us as righteous. He declares us 
as righteous. Why? Because he gives us his very own righteousness. That's what justification is. Okay? Justification. And so, to get to heaven, that's what you need. You need all your sins gone. The only way you can have them gone is by trusting Christ. And when you do, the payment he made is good on your behalf, and he gives you eternal life as a free gift. Now, that's salvation. You might say, whoo hoo well, that sounds good to me. I'm going to take that. Well, I hope you do. It's a gift. No strings. No strings. Okay? It isn't, here's what it declares, and then there's small print at the bottom that takes it away, like some religions teach. No, friend, listen, it's over here. For by grace are you saved through faith in Christ, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But that being true in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Go to chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? What shall we say then? Now watch this. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? All right. Chapter 6 addresses the issue of sanctification. We've looked at justification. Now we go on to sanctification. The word sanctify means to set apart, to make pure and holy. It shares the same root word as the words holy and saint. All right. One dictionary uh, defines it this way. It means holy, set apart, sanctified, consecrated. And it is also the root word for the word saint. Now, once you've trusted Christ as Savior, God declares you as a saint. Did you know that? No religion can put that on you at the end of your life once you're dead and say, well, you know, they lived a good life. We'll declare them as a saint. That's blasphemy. No one has that power except God. The good news is this. Anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior, the moment you trust Christ, God declares you as a saint that very moment. You can know you're a saint. Now, how many of you have trusted Christ alone as your Savior today? Raise your hand, okay? Okay, there you go. So you can put in front of your name, you could put saint. Take your first name. Okay, there's Saint Arnie in the front here, okay? I know you got to use your imagination a little bit, but... uh, (laughs) No, you know what? I have no problem whatsoever because I know he's trusted Christ. God has put his very own righteousness to Arnie's account. God declares him as righteous, and he says he's a saint. Okay? St. Taylor over there. St. Julia over there. I'm going around. They're all over, okay? Now, listen, if you think, well, no, you know, I don't buy that. I, I think you got to be good to go to heaven. You're, not, you're an ain't. You're not a saint, you're an ain't. You ain't a saint. You're not going to heaven, friend. You're not going. I hate to tell you that, because you can't be saved by your works. Now, for those of us who are saved by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, here's a question, and it's a good question. People ask it. We're going to cover it today. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Okay, that's a legitimate question. Chapter 6 addresses this issue. Now, this issue of salvation or having eternal life, okay, there are three aspects to this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all three today. That's that's another message and series. There's justification. That's what happens the moment you trust Christ as Savior. Once you trust Christ as Savior, you are set apart you're saying, then it comes, you move into sanctification, all right? Sanctification has to do mainly with the Christian life, the Christian life. So all your Christian life, once you get saved till the day you die, God is working in your life, and that whole thing is called sanctification. And then ultimately, there's going to be glorification when we're taken home to be with the Lord, uh, when we meet the Lord near at the rapture, okay, that's, that's glorification, Justification dealing with past, sanctification dealing with present, uh, glorification dealing with the future. These three tenses. But here's the issue. We're talking about sanctification here. We're talking about now, once we're saved. You notice it in verse 1, this very important question. Shall we, what shall we say then? The fact, here's what he's saying. The fact that we have all of our sins taken care of, The fact that we're eternally secure in Christ, 
The fact that we're saved by grace, therefore it's not based on the way we live because that would be merit and that would be works. The fact that we can never be lost once we're saved because we have everlasting life, not life until we sin again. The fact that the Holy Spirit lives within us forever, okay, uh, in this entire life he's going to live within us. He, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. The fact that all of our sins are paid for, therefore there's nothing to send me to hell because all my sins were taken care of by Christ. All these things, that fact being true, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin even though all of our sins have been paid for in light of eternity? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, Let's cover this. Number one, we need to see what has happened to us. Here in verse one, uh, verses one through three, the question of verse one is often directed towards us, towards this church, towards me as the pastor, as the preacher, by two groups of people. All right? The first group are those believing in works for salvation. And they'll say something, uh, well, basically, they're, they're those who refuse to believe that salvation is a free gift through faith in Jesus Christ, even though chapter 5 said it six times. It's a gift. It's a free gift. It's a gift. It's a free gift over and over and over. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. You're, you're blaspheming God. You're saying the payment Jesus made was not sufficient. But their argument goes like this. Well, you people who say it's a gift and you just trust Christ and you're saved and, 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 uh, and you're saved forever no matter what you do, you're just, you're just saying it's okay to just go out and sin, 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 sin. All right? Well, wait a minute. I've never said that in my entire life. Except dealing with the false accusation. No, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what we have to say. What we're saying, though, is this, friends. Salvation is not based on your works. You don't go to heaven by your works. You don't get out of, uh, you don't lose your salvation because of your works. Getting to heaven is all what Christ has done on the cross. Now, once we've trusted Christ the Savior, does God want us to sin? Well, the answer is in verse 2. God forbid God forbid. You might say, oh, well, see that then? See that? We shouldn't sin. Let me ask you this. Do you still sin? Well, yeah, I sin a little bit. Wait, wait a minute. Doesn't matter if it's a little or a lot. You shouldn't do it, right? Does God want any of us to sin at any time? No, he doesn't. That is why Jesus had to go to the cross was because of our sin. They accuse us of believing that once you're saved, we think it's okay to sin and sin and sin some more. Okay? It's not okay, friend. It's not okay. Now, if you do abuse the grace of God, if you do abuse the fact that you're eternally secure, is that okay with God? It's not okay with God. That's the second group of people. Because believe it or not, there are plenty of Christians today that use the fact that once they're saved, they are saved forever, and that is true, and they can never be lost, and that is true, then they say, you know what? I've got my fire insurance. I'll just go and sin and live any way I want, and it's okay with God. Hey, it's not okay with God. The way we live our lives once we are saved is important to us, to the world, and to God himself. As a matter of fact, the way a Christian lives his life, there's a special judgment for that Christian once we get to heaven. It's called the judgment seat of Christ, where we will be rewarded according to how we lived our lives as believers. So works for the believer, for the believer, are important. Not to get us into heaven, not to keep us in heaven, but in a proper response to the fact that God was that gracious in giving us eternal life as a gift. Okay? There are those who uh, understand they can never lose it, and then they pervert the truth of God about our freedom in, in Christ into teaching that salvation is a license to sin. 
Salvation was never intended to be a license to sin. Listen, listen to me today. Listen. Because certain people pervert a doctrine of Scripture does not make that doctrine false. Okay? Yes, you can take your eternal life and your eternal security and turn it into a license, but that is absolutely condemned in Scripture. God is very strong. Look what he says in verse 2. God forbid... How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? See, both of these accusations uh, towards us are, both of them are false teaching, and they are both perversions of God's will. One thinking, well, you can't, you can't uh, live a sinful life and go to heaven, that's works for salvation. The other one saying, well, now that I'm saved, I can't ever be lost. Therefore, I'll just go sin, sin, sin. Well, that is using it as license. Neither of those things are biblical. Neither of them are right. And to be honest with you, if we're going to get attacked, let me get attacked by both groups. That way I know we're right where we ought to be. Okay? No, you can't earn your way to heaven, but no, you shouldn't use your salvation as a license to sin. There you go. Well, I'm upset with him. Thank you. That's exactly where we wanted to be. So again, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now that doesn't mean you're dead to sin in the sense that you can't sin anymore because Christians do sin and the Bible is very clear and we will see that as we go through this passage. By the way, it also answers the issue of what change has taken place in a believer in relation to his sin nature. Listen, we're born into the world with a sin nature when you trust Christ, and, and we are in bondage to the sin nature until we get saved. When we trust Christ the Savior, God gives us a new nature, and here you go. I'm getting ahead of myself, but watch this. The power of bondage of the old nature has been broken. But it's still there because we still sin. Okay? We still sin. When we trusted Christ the Savior, we were crucified with Christ. He was our substitute. His death is our death. But just as Christ was raised from the dead with new life, we too have a new nature now, and God has a new life for us to live as believers. This is the message of Scripture, verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now, this is not water baptism here, but spiritual baptism. These chapters are not talking about water baptism. They're talking about salvation, which is through faith, and the results of that salvation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 talks about, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. There's a spiritual baptism. When you trust Christ as Savior, you're baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. He comes to live within your body and my body. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in the believer today until we are taken home, all right? But that's the first thing we need to see. We need to see what has happened to us, and that's what we see in verses 1 through 3, okay? We were saved, we were, we were crucified with Christ, and yet God gave us a new life, which leads us to the second point is this. We need to see the will of God for our lives, the will of God for our lives once we're saved, verses 4 through 14, all right? Okay, and I've got several subpoints on this because it breaks that down. What is the will of God for the life of a believer? Now, remember, we're talking about Christians. Once you're saved. Well, the first one is this. We should walk in newness of life. We see it in verse 4. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Do you see that word should? 
Boy, that's an important word. That's an important word. It's just like in Ephesians 2.10, where it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus on two good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. See, it doesn't say here in verse 4 that we must walk in them, because that would be works for salvation. And it doesn't say that we will walk in them. Because this text is very clear that we as Christians still sin and we have the capability to sin, but we're not, it's not the will of God that we sin, okay? I know I'm repeating myself, but folks, a lot of people don't get this. A lot of Christians don't get this. Hold your place here and look with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, you're in Romans, you would go to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, then Galatians. Chapter 2, and here's what's taken place. We need to see the will of God for our lives. We should walk in newness of life. Here you go, Galatians 2.20, look at it with me. It says, I am crucified with Christ, okay? God wants us to think When you got saved, you died. The old you died, okay? The old you died. Think about it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, this speaks of this, this, uh, the Christian life is an issue of sanctification, this being set apart to the Lord. Sanctification is what we experience as Christians as we walk by faith, surrendered to the Lord, and obedient to His Word. This has to do with Christian growth. Christian growth, right? Growing as a believer. When we get saved, God wants us to grow. Jesus said in John 3, you must be born again. When you trust Christ as Savior, you're born again. You're born into the, into the family of God. But just like any baby born into a family, that baby is a baby. And what's normal is for that baby now to grow and develop and grow up and get bigger and so forth and get better understanding and mature, okay? Over time, that baby will mature into an adult, Lord willing, And that's the way it's supposed to be. Guess what? Same thing in the family of God. You're born into the family of God. Justification. And then we are to grow. Sanctification. Until the Lord takes us home. Glorification. This is the process. And so once we're saved, does God have a purpose for our lives? Yes, he does. And that whole Christian life has to do with this issue of sanctification. Okay, being saved from the power of sin on a daily basis. That's what God wants for you and me. See, when you're, before you're saved, you're in bondage to sin. Watch this. Once you get saved, the bondage of that is broken. Why? God wants us to understand you were crucified with Christ. Consider your old self to be dead. Now, I know we still sin. I know the old man is still there. Okay? But the bondage has been broken, and God wants us to be thinking in these terms. You know what? Hey, bud, when I got saved, you were crucified. I'm through with you. I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. What I want to do is I want to live now according to my new man, okay? I don't want to think like this. I don't want to be like this any longer. I want to be like the Lord. I want to be Christ-like in the way I live my life. And then God... If we cooperate with him, again, how? By faith, walking by faith in the word of God, surrendered to the Lord and obedient to his word. And as we do that, we will become more and more mature as believers, and we will realize more and more victory in our lives, victory over sin, victory over addictions, victory over uh, bad habits and wrong ways and all that. Folks, let me say this. If you've been saved any length of time, 
Hopefully, you're making progress. Hopefully, I'm making progress. Are we ever going to be perfect in this life? No. Okay? As one preacher said, and it's great, and I've used it many times, we'll never be sinless, but we ought to sin less. That's sanctification. That's sanctification. Okay? 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere, the undefiled milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. God wants his children to be growing. That is normal. It's the way it should be. All right? Doesn't always go that way, though. Make no mistake about it. Spiritual growth in the life of a Christian, is the express will of God in the life of every Christian. Let me show you another passage, which is just absolutely wonderful. Turn with me a few pages over to your right (laughs) um, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Look at this. Verse 1. Here you go. If ye then be risen with Christ. Remember, we are crucified with Christ, but we are raised. Okay? We're supposed to walk in newness of life. If ye then be risen with Christ, what are we supposed to do? Seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse 2. Set your affection. Set your affection, your desires, your mind. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? For you are dead. You died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You see, the new life we have to live is to bring glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Consider this again, friend. You got saved. Consider when you got saved, you died. The old you died, okay? And I'll give you some application of this in just a minute that is simply profound. The old man died. That's the old life, okay? I know how I was, you know, all the baggage, all the problems, all the things that now that we're saved, we look back and you say, boy, I'll tell you, I'm so embarrassed by that stuff. You know what? Let's leave it there. Let's leave it there. God has cleansed us. He's given us new life in Christ, and he's given us a new identity, and he's given us a new life to live. Yeah, that's what it's about. That's what Romans 6 is about. By the way, 7. By the way, 8. So the new life is to bring glory to God. Let's go back to Romans. Back to Romans. So we see, we we need to see the will of God for our lives. First, we should walk in newness of life, this new life that we have. Secondly, though, we should not serve sin. We should not serve sin, verses 5 through 7. Now, this is interesting because those who believe in this false lordship, grace and work salvation, it's a false salvation, it's a counterfeit, say, well, if you're saved, you can't serve sin. The Bible never says that about the believer. What the Bible says is that we shouldn't serve sin. It doesn't say we can't. It says we shouldn't. Right here in our text, verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Okay? Uh, rendered inoperative or inactive or idle or useless, that henceforth, in other words, from this, from that point forward, from henceforth we should not serve sin. Why? For he that is dead is freed from sin. That's how we need to see it. Wait a minute, the bondage of the old life before I was saved, I don't need to live in that bondage anymore. I've been freed up because I died. Hey, friends, You cannot tempt a dead man. 
doesn't work. Okay? Let's say there's some man and his whole life he had a problem with pornography and then he died. Well, you could, you could take all the pornography you want and put it in front of him and guess what? He's not going to respond. He's not going to respond. See, that's the way God wants us to see it. Now, in reality, yeah, the old man is still there, but here it is. His power has been broken. We don't have to be dominated anymore by it. That's the issue here. That henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. So verse 6 tells us how we should live in light of the fact that verse 7 gives us our position. We're freed from sin. Therefore, we should not serve sin. See, if you are saved, the bondage has been broken. You're free. The only reason, friends, the only reason we remain under bondage is that we choose to live that way. It's a choice. We have been set free to live for Christ. Let me say this today. I'll give you just one example where people are, are messed up on this. See, this is one of the, and by the way, I love our addictions program here. Based on the truth of Scripture, it's realistic, it's biblical, okay? Lives can be transformed, there's, there's, there's clarity in what it teaches, and yes, people can learn to live in freedom in Christ, and yes, freedom in Christ, but that's not freedom to sin, it's freedom to live a godly life. It's, it's a life that is free from the bondage of sin. That's what God calls us to. But here's some, some other addictions programs, okay? They sit around and, you know, what are, what are you? Here's what they say. Well, I'm a drug addict. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a whatever. I'm this. I'm that. Okay, I'm an abuser. All that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that your identity? You see what I'm saying? But that's what they do, right? Come on, admit it. I'm an alcoholic. I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If you're saved, you got a new identity. Here's what you ought to be saying. I was an alcoholic, but I got saved, and God freed me from the bondage, and therefore I am going to identify with the fact I'm a child of God. Not an alcoholic, okay? Not an abuser, not this, not that. Those are things having to do with my old nature, and I don't want to be identified with that anymore. I want to be identified with Christ. That's the way we ought to be living. You got a new identity. You're a saint, remember? You got saved. You're a saint. What the? I'm this, I'm this, I'm that. Hey, I'm a saint, I'm a child of the King. That's the way it needs to be. So we should not serve sin. Third, under this, we should live for Christ, okay? So we shouldn't serve sin. Rather, we should, verses 8 through 11, live for Christ. Verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Do you see that? You're dead with Christ, and death has no more dominion over Jesus, and therefore doesn't have dominion over you and me as believers. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, verse 11 is key. Likewise, just like it is with Jesus, likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon, okay? We are to count upon the fact and put to our account the fact that we are dead indeed to sin. We should see it that way. Here's what it is, folks. Temptation comes knocking. Say, who is it? Uh... I'm lust, and I'm here to give you a hard time. Sorry, I died. Go find somebody else. I'm dead to you. I'm not interested any longer. Now, before you're saved, you really didn't have a whole lot of choice. 
But you know what? Once you get saved, the bondage has been broken and you can say no and look to the Lord and cry out to him and he will help you because now you have a new nature. Now you have the Holy Spirit. Now we've got the word of God and there's power there to overcome sin. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. By the way, this word dead here is the Greek word nekros, and it means to, like a corpse. In other words, consider yourself like a corpse. Okay? Dead. Dead to sin. Sin comes. I'm tempting you. I'm tempting you. Sorry, I died. Not interested. You might say, wait a minute, though. You're alive. Yeah, I am for Christ. I have a new life, okay? I have a new life. The bondage of the sin nature has been broken. We do not have to live under the power of sin any longer. And then it goes on in verses 12 through 14. Now watch this very carefully, okay? We should no longer let sin reign in our bodies. Now, we're not talking about the stuff that comes down from the sky. We're talking about the, the thing that rules us, okay? We should no longer let sin reign in our bodies, verse 12. Therefore, or excuse me, let not sin therefore reign in your body that you should obey it in the lusts thereof, okay? Now, listen carefully, because those who believe in a quote-unquote a lordship salvation, they say, well, if you're saved, sin won't reign in your body. That's what they say. It can't reign in your body. If you're saved, it can't happen. But wait a minute. Why is Paul telling these Roman believers not to let it happen if it can't happen? All right? We are commanded to not let sin reign in our bodies. It would be a waste of time for Paul to bring this up if it was automatic that if you're saved, it's not going to happen. No, he's, he's saying it can happen, but don't let it happen. Do you see that's the balance of this? It is possible that it can, but we're not to let it take place. Verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Wait a minute. If a true Christian can't do that, then why is Paul telling these saints not to let it happen? No, they can, but they shouldn't. But instead, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members, your body parts, as instruments of righteousness unto God. Do you see it in verse 13? Let's read that again. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but, in other words, in contrast to that, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. This is how we should live as believers. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under Grace. In other words, it's unnecessary for sin to have dominion over you, over me, any longer. Why? Well, because we're saved, the bondage has been broken, we were crucified with Christ, we have a new life to live, and therefore we don't have to let that happen any longer. We don't have to let it happen. It can, but don't let it. I love the clarity of the Word of God. I love the clarity. Yeah, you hear these preachers all the time on radio and on YouTube and TV and in books. They say, well, you know, real Christians don't practice sin. 1 John 3. Well, let me say this. I, we have dealt in detail with those passages, and you can go and you can listen to those messages on 1 John. And uh, the Bible is very, very clear, friend, that Christians can practice sin but we shouldn't let it happen in our lives, okay? So that's where the balance is in this. So lastly today, we need to see the way to victory, and this is just a summary, okay? The first thing is this. Count on the fact, that's what the word reckon means. Count on the fact that your old nature has been crucified and the power of it was rendered idle. <clears throat> rendered idle, that's what the word destroyed means back there in a few verses back. Rendered idle. 
In other words, I do not have to, I like what one Bible teacher said. He says, he says the, uh, uh, what happened, he says, it's kind of like a motorcycle. Imagine with a motorcycle that, uh, with a clutch on a motorcycle, imagine a motorcycle that is just stuck on full speed. And you can't stop it. You can't stop it. Okay? But once you put the clutch in, all you got to do is put the clutch down, and what happens? That power is cut, right? Once you put the clutch on, once you engage the clutch. Guess what? When we got saved, God gave us a clutch. And yes, the old nature is still there, but you, don't, you, can, you can say, wait a minute, stop, Okay? and you trust the Lord, and He helps you overcome that, you don't have to give in to it, right? And rather, we turn our eyes on Christ, which is the second thing under this. Trust or depend upon the Lord for strength to have victory and live for Him. And then third, obey His Word. So count on the fact that the old nature has been crucified and its power rendered idle. Trust or depend upon the Lord for strength to have victory over sin and to live for him, and then obey the word of God. God will give us the power to obey. Okay, He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us a new nature, and he's given us the word of God. I hope this makes sense to you today. This chapter 6 is key to understanding how the Christian life works. Okay, New identity, new power, new purpose. How wonderful is that? We're going to close over in John chapter 3. Turn there with me, John chapter 3, because you could possibly be here today and you still are not sure where you're going when you die. Well, let me, let me show you something that is absolutely tremendous, dear friend. In John chapter 3, look with me to verse 16. John three sixteen. it says this, for God so loved the world. You know, that's, that includes you. That includes you. And so you don't know my background. You don't know this. It doesn't matter if I know it. God does. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he loves you. He loves you. For God so loved the world. How do I know that? Well, there it is, that he gave his only begotten son. God sent the son to be your savior. Jesus came into the world to die for your sins so you don't have to. He paid the price so you don't have to. And he offers you eternal life as a free gift. He did all the work so you don't have to. There's no work for you to do. It's just taking him at his word. Look at it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, here's the one condition, that whosoever believeth in him, you putting your faith in him as your savior, should not perish. There's a promise. You won't end up lost. Should not perish, but have what kind of life? Everlasting. Everlasting. Break that word down. Okay, turn it around. Lasting, ever. Okay, perpetual, never-ending, nonstop. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he gives you eternal life. If you have that, you go to heaven, okay? Never stops. What if I do things wrong? Well, remember, Christians still do things wrong. But how many of your sins were paid for on the cross? All of them were paid. See, you, you can be sure you're going to heaven because you can't go to hell. So God gives eternal life. Trust Christ if you've never done that. Would you do that today? Let's all bow in prayer, shall we? As we close today, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, please, no one looking around. Friend, you may have never heard any of this today, but I'm glad you heard it today. I really am. And this is the message of the Word of God. This is true Christianity. This is not religion. This is not something that takes the name Christianity and then perverts the message or the way of God. No, this is the truth. Jesus has paid for all your sins. He is God in the flesh who paid for your sins. And he rose from the grave to prove it was done. And he offers you right now the gift of everlasting life. You can have it if you'll simply put your faith, your trust in him 
right now as your Savior. Would you do that? In the quietness of your mind, you know, God knows your thinking, knows every thought. He's not asking you to make promises. He did all the work, okay? Making promises to behave will not save you. Only Jesus can save you. Would you right now trust in him as your Savior? He knows your thoughts. All he's looking for is faith. Trust in him. Would you do that? Lord, the best I know how, I'm trusting Christ as Savior. I know I'm a sinner. I understand today. I can't be good enough. I can't earn it. But I'm trusting Christ today as my Savior. And if you'll trust him, friend, he will save you. Would you do that? Would you do that? If you're doing that today, you've never done it before, I'd love to pray for you. Could I, could I pray for you? I won't embarrass you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone who would say, yes, I, I finally understood this today. Today I trusted Christ as Savior. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up. Would you do that? In that indicating that today you trusted Christ as Savior. Okay? You don't have to raise your hand. It just lets me know that it made sense to you, and I'd like to pray for you. Is there anyone? Just slip it up, put it down. Is there anyone? Pray for me. Today I trusted Christ. Is there anyone? Okay, with heads bowed and eyes closed still, let me say today, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, do you understand, hopefully even better today, what God's desire is for you? Do you understand what took place when you got saved, dear friend? You died, the old life, okay? The things of the past, you know, things we know that they're wrong. We know they're wrong, but we keep doing them. And they're part of that old life, Listen, God is calling us to live a new life for him. The old man was crucified. Let's not go back there. It only brings bondage. Father, we thank you for your word, the clarity of it. Thank you, Father, that we have this great privilege to open it and read it and understand your ways, which are so clear and they make so much sense. Help us reject all the false ideas out there about these things, knowing that they only breed confusion and bondage. Thank you for each one here, Lord. Bless each one. Bring them back tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much and God bless you.